Here I am at the press and filmmakers reception, which means no publicists and no public. And I'm standing with one of the bravest filmmakers, I think, that are here. I'd like you to introduce yourself so I don't mispronounce your name and the, the title of your film. My name is Lyric Arcabral, one of the co-directors of the documentary Terror, which is in the United States documentary competition. And Tara is about an informer. Tara is about an FBI informant. And it's told from the point of view of the FBI informer. Yes. As much as there's a point of view in this film, what is so wonderful, if I can use that word, or so difficult, which is a better word for the audience, is that the objectivity in this film, which is sort of contrary to what we were supposed to learn about documentary, but you don't really take a point of view of advocacy on the surface of your film. And can you tell me how you came to that decision? Well, I always think the most powerful type of filmmaking is a documentary or any type of film experience where the audience sort of is able to change their perceptions through just watching the film. So in that, I thought it was important that, you know, my co-director and myself, we didn't want to impose our particular opinions on the film. We just wanted to simply present facts. You know, we had great access. We just wanted to simply present that access for audiences and allow them to make their own judgments about this case. I know for myself as an audience member, I was very troubled at the end of the film. How did I feel about this man? Um, and how did I feel about a justice system? Yes. And how did I feel about an FBI that paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to informers that are not trained? Yes. You know, and not protected, it would seem, too. Yes. Um, so you left me sitting in my seat with all of these questions, and that to me is exactly what a good documentary film should do. Absolutely, and we know that the, the film is encouraging a lot of discussion, and we do hope to have a strong impact campaign around the film. We plan to screen it in a lot of secular um, and religious communities. Just we need to have Know Your Rights workshops in conjunction with this film. We plan to partner with some civil liberties organizations um, in order to really, you know, after screenings, when people have that feeling of what can we do, there, there will be concrete steps that individuals can take to protect themselves from this type of I started off by saying it's a film about an informer. And yes, it is a film about an informer, but it's also a film very specifically about the Muslim community post 9-11. Yes. And how Americans are being trained to look at the Muslim community by our yes. mass media, uh, to be suspicious yes. of everyone, of someone who looks different yes. because of their religious principles. So. Oh, this look one who's in. here. It's the pulled out the flip cam. <laughs> Hi, David. This is David. Would you introduce yourself, please? I'm David Felix Sutcliffe. I'm the co-director of Terror. We were just having a little discussion, and we start, I started off by talking about it's a film about the informer. But it's, more, but it's just as much a film about Muslims. And where did you find, and I don't know what the proper word is, but the person who's the head of the mosque with the red beard? Oh, the director of security, Ali Karim of Masjid Taqwa in Brooklyn. Uh, because he, um, it was very interesting to hear how he talked about the informer. It was very interesting to hear how the mother of Tariq, the jazz musician who is now in jail, talked about the informer. In essence, uh, one was um, talking about what I would call karma. Um, they didn't use that word. And that a person has to live with himself. Uh, how did you find that particular mosque? And how did you get the mother to be so open with you? Well, um, that particular mosque was connected to the informant's crimes. Two, two people who were charged with crimes of terrorism came from that Islamic community. And so it was important to us as journalists to sort of trace the impacts of the informant's actions and to see how, you know, ten years later, what the ramifications of his actions, how, how has he destroyed the fabric of this community, how people changed their responses, and, you know, as membership in the masjid declined. Just we were very interested in the community's reaction after that betrayal. And the mom? Uh, the mother, that's actually a lyric story to tell. Oh, but it's okay. I mean, she, there's just people who are very supportive in giving us access and telling the story because I think, you know, you never hear from the families of terrorism defenders. They rarely have an opportunity to speak unless it's, the, you know, the moment the arrest is being announced. Yeah, they got a 30 sound, second soundbite it, unless it's on Amy Goodman, you know. Um, I remember watching Newberg 4, mm -hmm. and uh, the aunt in that film was so articulate and so moving, and, and that's who I thought of when I heard the mother talking about her son, and how black mothers show up for their children. I, uh, did you make a comment about that, about black motherhood, and how they are so... 
I not mean, saying sure. you're a mother, but you, but you live in that community. Absolutely, and I think in this particular case, since you're talking about Marlene, the mother of Tariq Shah, um, you know, Marlene is maintaining a powerful legacy. Tariq Shah's father was the lieutenant of Malcolm X, and that whole family was raised to carry themselves a certain way and not to shy from conflict and to publicly present themselves a particular way. So I think, you know, as a black woman, she has to defend her child. You know, she, her child came from a history of surveillance. That family was monitored through the father's activities, you know, so this is just a continuation of, I mean, Marlene feels this is just a continuation of the surveillance that started in the 60s with Malcolm. There are two things about the informer that I'd like to ask David about. One is, at one point, a quarter of a million dollars was talked about that he had gotten. Yeah. And it was just sort of dropped into the film, and then we went on to another subject. And I was shocked, uh, A, about his condition today, which is pretty much he has no money. Yeah. Uh, and, and how the government throws this money around that none of us know about. Who are they accountable to? Are they accountable to anyone? Is there any oversight on how these programs work? Well, the Attorney General released a set of guidelines in 2006, but there's no... There's no real oversight over whether those guidelines are even be, being followed. And that's one thing that we're hoping the film will lead to, will lead to public pressure for congressional oversight. Um, in terms of the money that was spent, you know, absolutely, like in, in some of his previous cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars are being spent in the course of these investigations. And what the FBI often does is they, they will pay the informant before conviction, you know, a, a moderate amount. It'll be like based on a weekly rate or a monthly rate. But the, there's a kind of an unspoken understanding between informants and their handlers that if the case provide, if, there, if there's a successful convi conviction, there'll be a substantive uh, bonus provided. And the reason the FBI does that is because they don't want the informant to go up on stand and have to testify about how much money exactly they are expected to receive uh, through, as a result of their work. That's disgusting. So, yeah. That is a legal tactic. I mean, it, it pay off. It, it just it encourages people to lie or do whatever they can to win this case. Absolutely. What do you want the takeaway to be from this movie with the audience and, and the media? Yeah. We, we really want to avoid boiling it down into like a packaged bumper sticker in terms of like, this is wrong or this is right. It's really about a conversation. We feel like democracy relies on a healthy dialogue and debate. And these issues and these tactics are something that we need to discuss further. We need to know more about them. And that's why we've made this film, is to inform the public, because there hasn't been information available. And we're hoping this will provide some critical information that will help shape that conversation and hopefully lead to some oversight and some changes in the way that these counterterrorism investigations are being operated. You want to add anything more? And hopefully it will encourage the media to look more critically at these cases because typically, you know, the arrest reports are taken right from the FBI press report. You know, the, the lines that are announced when terrorism convict, when terrorism arrests are made, the exact headlines that are repeated on the news are those that come from the FBI's press release, the FBI's sort of statement of charges. So hopefully this film will encourage the media to take a more critical look at these cases and to seek to interview the family members and those closest to the defendants. Well, you nailed that one TV journalist who's just mouthing whatever was put into his hands. Um, there's one question that I'm going to end with, and that is, when I realized that these informers were basically people that were being blackmailed into informing, either they had some arrest record or they were illegal immigrants, and, and they also were not trained, is, is do, from your point of view, is that the policy of the FBI with the kind of informant on the Muslim or, or, or the black radical movement? Is, what is, there is, that, is that the kind of, 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 that is how they proceed? Is that a procedural choice, a policy choice, that they don't really train these informers, but they pick them up because they know they're vulnerable? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, the informants themselves are vulnerable. In the case of the Muslim community, you know, many Arabic-speaking folks are immigrants. So a lot of people have immigration violations that the FBI are able to use as leverage in these cases, criminal violations. You know, people in New York City, it has been reported that the NYPD has been stopping taxi drivers simply to see if they may have something on them that can be used to encourage this individual still, to become still doing Yes, that? yes. That's an interesting stop and yes. first aspect of it. Yes. Uh, one last question to David. What would you say to me to say to my friend who's a progressive, uh, who says to me, you know what, Jim, I'd rather be safe than not. Tell him to watch this movie and see if he still feels that way. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you so